Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. Before we get into today's topic, I want to say a big thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Skillshare is an online learning platform that hosts thousands of classes from people willing to share their skills so you can develop yours. There are so many classes to choose from, you are sure to find something to take your fancy. This month, I thought I'd learn about plants with Christopher Griffin, with the hope that some green thumb knowledge might be shared. I am not good with plants. I'm a horticultural nightmare, but I don't want to be. This course, especially the sections on perfect plants and beginner plants, is bringing me some hope and courage to have a go myself. Skillshare is a creative and inspiring community. Skillshare is the place to keep you learning. With a Skillshare membership, you can access their ever-growing list of premium classes to explore whenever suits you. There are also live sessions that you can try if you want that real-time learning environment. The first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare so you can start exploring your creativity today. Skillshare has very kindly sponsored a few videos on this channel. Along the way, I decided to make a kind of series out of these sponsored videos that looked at the people who escaped from the Tower of London. Today, I think it's time to look at people moving in the other direction. To tell the story of the time the Tower of London was successfully breached. Let's look at the skill of invading the Tower from a group who managed it. The invasion of the Tower of London that we are looking at today occurred on the 14th of June 1381 and was part of the so-called Peasants' Revolt. Before we get on to the breaching of the tower itself, let's explore the historical landscape that is viewed by many as a key factor that contributed to the revolt as a whole. Just over 30 years before the events we are investigating today, the Black Death ripped through the nations of Britain as it had mainland Europe, where it is believed to have claimed around 20 million lives. It is estimated by some that between a third to a half of the British population were killed. In the 14th century, feudalism was the order of the day in England. The vast majority of the population were peasants, who were effectively tethered to the land they had received from their lord, which they would then work for their lord's benefit and to sustain themselves. So, in times of drought or flood, the farm of a peasant may scarcely provide enough to feed them and their family. It would be a matter of lordly whim or conscience if they would still be expected to provide their service, so crops or livestock, in such dire circumstances. The feudal system divided people up into strata. There were those who ruled, the king or barons, those who prayed, bishops and monks, those who fought, knights, and those who laboured or worked, the peasant, villain, or serf. The estate in which the last of these existed is also known as serfdom. The Black Death challenged this system. For example, if one or even ten ruling barons were to die, their responsibilities, wealth and power would be inherited by their heir. Failing that, it could fairly easily be absorbed by another noble without being too onerous. The same is not true for a worker or number of workers. The field of crops to be planted or harvested doesn't shrink, but having substantially less people to farm it can create real issues in a short space of time. Scarcity increases value, or at least that is how it is frequently understood in a free market. 
feudalism was not a free market. By around 1350, this wave of the Black Death had done its worst. But in the very next year, 1351, a new statute was created. The Statute of Labourers was created by the government of King Edward III to set wages at pre-plague levels. Refusal to work for this set amount would result in imprisonment. The capacity for people to travel to seek better terms for employment was also curtailed. The legal change was no doubt unpopular. There were surely those who recognised the unfairness of creating a new law at a time when labour was in short supply and more land was available to block the poorest in society from bettering their lot. The recognition of the unfairness of the differentiation between the haves and the have-nots remained a pressing issue. Indeed, it was a rallying issue presented in a sermon given by the priest John Bull to the rebels in 1381. Bull is reputed to have asked, When Adam delved and Eve span, who was then the gentleman? From the beginning, all men by nature were created alike, and our bondage, or servitude, came in by the unjust oppression of naughty men. For if God would have had any bondmen from the beginning, he would have appointed who should be bond and who free. And therefore I exhort you to consider that now the time is come, appointed to us by God, in which ye may, if ye will, cast off the yoke of bondage and recover liberty. Although this was arguably a continuous issue from 1351 to 1381, other things certainly changed, arguably in ways that could have spurred on the revolt. King Edward III, the monarch behind the Statute of Labourers, died in 1377. He was succeeded on the throne by his 10-year-old grandson, Richard II. I made a video on the potential pitfalls of having a boy king, which I will leave linked. But suffice to say, it could be a destabilising thing for a nation to face in terms of power and politics. As a side note, would anyone find it useful if I were to make a video about the line of monarchs, their claim to the throne, and how they ended up with their bottom on the good seat? Do let me know in the comments section. Returning back to Richard II, due to his youth, it was necessary for others to wield power on his behalf. In Richard's case, it was his uncle, John of Gaunt, who was one that prominently performed this role. In the following century, Gaunt's descendants were the House of Lancaster, one side of the Wars of the Roses. I'll leave my video on John of Gaunt linked. During Richard II's reign, his uncle was the focus of suspicion, from those who thought he harboured his own desires to rule and outright hostility, due to the policies he promoted. In 1380, Parliament sat at Northampton rather than at Westminster, which Helen Carr explains was due to the heightened tensions between John of Gaunt and London citizens caused by Gaunt's decision to threaten the Bishop of London and his overstepping and meddling in city and mercantile affairs. The boy king had also inherited military commitments along with his crown. There were troops to be supported on the Scottish border and in Calais. Additionally, there was a war with France to fight, where Not much progress was being made, despite the expensive campaigning and the damage done by French raids on the south of England. The expenses had to be covered. Taxation was heavy, and the burden of it was felt more sharply between 1377 and 1381, when three poll taxes were also imposed. The tactics used by collectors during the last of these, in 1381, was the spark that ignited the powder keg of simmering resentment. In 1381, the new Lord Chancellor, Simon Sudbury, 
had been in his important advisory post for a year. As such, he would come to be viewed as being highly responsible for the terms of the new poll tax, in which every person over the age of 15 was commanded to pay three groats, three times the amount expected during the poll tax of 1377. This poll tax was not means tested. Rich and poor alike were expected to pay the same whether they could afford it or not. Poll is the arcane word for head, so this was a tax per head rather than one based on money or property held. In the history of these islands, poll taxes have been a spectacularly poor idea for any government not wanting to incite rebellion. In 1381, the original idea was to collect the poll tax essentially in instalments, with one wave in spring and the next in summer. But Richard II's treasurer had other ideas. Robert Hales demanded the sum be collected all at once. There was large-scale avoidance of the tax, which led to commissioners being dispatched from March 1381 to enforce payment. Many of those being taxed were pushed to violent breaking point, while some of the tax collectors were emboldened by the desperation of some of those that they encountered to take such liberties as to make them and their colleagues even more unpopular. Some bailiffs were run out of town, while others simply refused to enact the collections, as they feared they would be killed. At the end of May, violence erupted. It is reported that justices in Essex were attacked with bows and arrows. The rebellion spread through Essex into Hertfordshire, Cambridgeshire, Suffolk and Kent. Despite the name, the Peasants' Revolt, and what that might conjure in our minds about the people that were involved, the rebels were far more diverse than is probably imagined. Men and women stood side by side in the rebellion, and I've got a personal connection on this point. I got to represent one of these women, Joanna Farrar, at the Tower of London. I'll insert a picture of me rabble-rousing as her here. Court documents describe her as chief perpetrator and leader of rebellious evildoers from Kent. This uprising was certainly formed of the poorest serfs, those most typically imagined, I would argue, when we hear the word peasant. But they marched beside members of the clergy, bailiffs, landowners and tenants with land and goods who held manorial offices. There is an ongoing academic investigation that is exploring, among other things, how many of these rebels may have had military experience, with some believed to have been ex-soldiers. The team conducting this research is also interested in how much the militarisation of society contributed to the rising. On the 10th of June, Watt Tyler, who is remembered as the leader of the Kentish rebels, led his group of rebels into Canterbury. As they travelled, they attacked the property of the nobility. They freed prisoners from Rochester Castle. They killed prominent citizens in Canterbury and they made demands that the hated Archbishop of Canterbury, who was also Lord Chancellor Simon Sudbury, be replaced. Supporters joined the rebels as they moved towards London. On the 12th of June, 1381, the rebels made camp at Blackheath, just southeast of London. It was at Blackheath that the priest John Bull delivered that reputed sermon that I read earlier. The group demanded entry into the city of London. It is believed that the gates were opened by a sympathiser or sympathisers. Richard II, who was by now aged 14, was prepared to meet the rebels at Rotherhithe on the 13th of June. But as the royal barge approached, it seems the numbers gathered, which are estimated to have been more than 100,000, 
was deemed to be too great a risk. The King was returned to the safety of the Tower of London. The same day, perhaps in response, the rebels destroyed the headquarters of the Hospitallers at Clerkenwell and also John of Gaunt's Savoy Palace. Indeed, it was Joanna Farrar who would be charged with burning it to the ground, in addition to stealing a chest of gold from a duke. Also that day, immigrants were murdered, with the Flemish seeming to be particular targets for the violence. The next day, the 14th of June, 1381, Richard II would meet with some of the rebels at Mile End to hear their demands. He would agree to all their terms. Richard was apparently not the focus of the rebels' fury. They claimed they believed he was surrounded by corrupt and evil councillors who needed to be removed for everyone's sake, King Richard II included. On the same day as the Mile End meeting, a group of armed rebels would breach the Tower of London. In times gone by, the notion of a band of pitchfork-wielding, stinky peasants with, if you watch the historical fiction, about three teeth between them and an apparently pathological aversion to using a comb, the thought of them being able to breach one of the most heavily fortified concentric castles ever built was, frankly, laughable. Historical canon had it that, as with the gates of London, someone in the tower must have let them in. Now, according to more recent and ongoing research, we are aware that the rebels were far more diverse than once thought. Additionally, even the poorest peasant is unlikely to have walked to London looking like a human haystack that's been splattered with dung. Plus, Skeletal evidence points to medieval people having, for the most part, far better teeth than their descendants from the 16th century and beyond due to the scarcity of sugar. It is now being suggested, as I mentioned earlier, that ex-soldiers or those of military experience were among the rebels. Does this make them capable of breaching the tower in a day? I'd say probably not. But I do wonder if the defences were lifted, not only due to sympathy to the cause, but perhaps also from the loyalty that is frequently found among brothers in arms. Once in the tower, the rebels found the king's hated councillors, including the treasurer, Robert Hales, and the Lord Chancellor, Simon Sudbury, who was discovered praying in St John's Chapel in the White Tower. The rebels dragged their quarry from the Tower of London up to Tower Hill, where they were beheaded. The executions of Simon Sudbury and Robert Hales are listed as the first known beheadings on the site that would eventually become so famous for that very punishment. Giving the order for Sudbury's beheading is another act that has been attributed to Joanna Farrar. John of Gaunt's son, Henry Bolingbroke, was, like his cousin, King Richard II, also 14 at the time of the uprising, albeit Henry was a few months younger. Richard, as we know, was away from the tower when it was breached. Henry was inside. He was either spared by the rebels or had been exceptionally well hidden. Personally, I am inclined to the well-hidden option. I think that if the rebels had discovered the son of the hated John of Gaunt, they would have beheaded him alongside Hales and Sudbury. Had they done so, he wouldn't have been around to depose his cousin in 1399 and become King Henry IV. The day after the bloodshed of the invasion of the Tower of London, so on the 15th of June 1381, Richard and his followers met the rebels once again, this time at Smithfield. It's unclear precisely what happened in the moments preceding it, but at this meeting, William Warworth, Lord Mayor of London, killed Wat Tyler. 
at once Richard II showing either a kingly demeanour beyond his years or the kind of arrogant self-belief that would eventually lose him all support seized the moment. As Wat Tyler fell, Richard addressed the rebels. He is reported to have told them that he would be their leader now. From following him, they would receive all that they sought, which was effectively the end of serfdom. He commanded them away from Smithfield, and eventually they were convinced to begin to return to their homes. All these royal promises were swiftly broken, both the ones made at Mile End and those at Smithfield. Richard is even accused of saying, Serfs you are, and serfs you will remain. And you will remain in bondage, not as before, but incomparably harsher. In the following months, the rebels were hotly pursued. Many were killed by judicial or military action when they were found. Interestingly, despite the active and violent part that women, like Joanna Farrar, played in the revolt, the records suggest that they were treated with far greater leniency than their male counterparts. Dr John Ridgard has said that he has found no records of women being executed or punished as harshly during his research on the topic. The men and women of the Peasants' Revolt did not end feudalism, but they must be credited with setting the scene for its decline and eventual abolition. The uprising represented an immense threat to the political stability of England. Those set above were perhaps a little too used to enjoying their rarefied status, a status which came about in large part because they were comparatively few in number. They relied upon a labouring class that outnumbered them. Maybe the revolt showed them, or reminded them, that there would be a risk to being outnumbered. But what do you think of the revolting peasants, of the breach of the Tower of London, or anything else I've mentioned today? Do let me know if you want me to make that video about the line of monarchs, where I will briefly set out how each one got their bum on the throne. As always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversations in the comments section underneath this video, or you can find me on social media. I'll leave links to the other places you can find me on the internet in my description box. Follow me over on some or all of them so we can continue this conversation and start some others. I do hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, why not share it with some friends? Please also let me know by hitting the thumbs up. Please subscribe to the channel and if you think you're subscribed, have a little check now to make sure that YouTube hasn't mysteriously unsubscribed you. While you're there, checking, subscribing, maybe resubscribing, why not hit the bell icon beside the subscribe button so that YouTube tells you when I've next uploaded. I hope you can have a great day whatever you're doing and I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.